are that puts you face to face with experts in real time so you can pick their brain and get advice relating to your business, your life, your health, and your relationships. Today we are talking about monetizing social media, actually not monetizing, actually quitting the grind and getting some impact out there, which is why you started social media in the first place. We have with us Matt Rouse. If you go to amathatgeek.com forward slash live right now, you can hop on in, have a conversation and us in person, face to face live, and we're going to get started. So hey, welcome to I'm That Geek Show. We're looking forward to meeting you face to face so we can help you specifically get over the challenges that you're having right now with your business, social media, marketing, podcasting, anything online. If you want to become first choice in your market, this is the show for you. I have with me uh, one of the nicest podcaster with one of the best questions uh, in a podcast, Matt Rouse. Hey, Matt, how are you? Hello, how are you? <laughs> Fantastic. First of Thank all, I love, you. Uh, I love your microphone. Your sound is like super Thanks. awesome. <laughs> this like was strangely, I got this for under 20 bucks on Amazon. I just typed in podcaster headset. And ta-da, we and got it. And I even lost the little foamy thing that's on the end. And I think my kid stole good. it because she's like three and she takes everything out of my office. <laughs> the beauty of kids, right? We have That's them right. so we can love them. Um, so you are an author, a podcaster, yes. an entrepreneur, yes. a business owner, yes. a father. Um, which I've got a lot of hats. You wear a lot of hats, That's right? That's right. I'm yeah. not, I should have a hat on right now to make up for it. And so I was a guest on your podcast, you and Jeremy, and you are mm -hmm. having such an amazing uh, podcast. The dynamic between the two of you is fantastic. So I want to talk about a few things today. Sure. One thing is um, a lot of people, when they think about social media, they think about, okay, content calendars, and I need to be everywhere, and I need to produce, you know, articles and images and videos, and now podcasting, everybody's getting into that. So it kind of feels like, you know, we're putting a lot of stuff out there and it takes forever to see the impact or the return on that investment. So when you wrote your book, was that the answer? Was that the challenge that you were trying to solve for, uh, for people who's going to read it? So the book is not specifically about social media, but social media is something that people spend a lot of time on, a lot more time than they should spend on it for most businesses. Um, and that's at the detriment of other things that they could be doing to improve their business. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, it's, it's opportunity cost. It's how doing the, spending the time that you're doing, maybe blogging or doing social media or whatever those things are that you're doing. What are you not doing because you're spending time on those things? Exactly. And how do you know if it's the right thing to do or not? And that's, that's the answer to the question that the book poses, which is how do you stop grinding? And how do you start making an impact? And so when we're thinking about that, like when we're thinking about grinding, my, my immediate thought is, you know, grinding content, but you're talking mm -hmm. about it in the business sense. So what does it look like in the business sense? So it's going to be different for every business, but grinding is when, and, and I kind of think of grinding as, as a term that kind of came for me from the video game world where you had a game and you get a certain amount of points or experience points or something when you like fight monsters. Right. So you'd have to fight monsters over and over and over and over and over to get up a level, right? And then you'd have to grind more and grind more and grind more. So there's always this grinding factor because it's cheaper to make content if you're making a video game where you make people do the same thing over and over than it is to make more new stuff. Right? Yeah, and so everybody who played World of Warcraft. Yeah, everybody who played World of Warcraft <laughs> yeah. knows about grinding, right? Knows about grinding, yeah. Um, but grinding is basically doing, doing the same task over and over for an eventual payoff. Yeah. And... In a lot of cases with social media, the payoff hasn't come, right? Yeah. Um, now that not saying that there hasn't been success stories. I mean, personally, for our business, we do a ton of social media, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But 
we don't do social media to get clients. We do social media to close the deal after we met the clients. And that's okay, so a different wait, wait, strategy. Is, yeah, that's major, 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 because everybody's using social media for lead generation. Right. And social media is, is for most businesses is not a good acquisition strategy. It's an activation strategy. And what happens is those are two separate things, right? Mm -hmm. So getting a lead and turning a lead into a customer should be two steps, not one. I love it. So the problem is people are saying they're on social media and they're, they're posting stuff, trying to get people to find out about them and become a customer all in one step. Mm. What they need to be doing is using, like if lead generation is the goal on their social media, then they should be trying to get those people to subscribe to them so that they can then eventually activate them from another medium. So an example would be getting, putting out content on social media, maybe putting some ad dollars behind that so you can reach more people and then having them read that content. And then in that content, you have some kind of a thing where they can subscribe, like a lead magnet or something to get them on a list. And then you use the emails that you send out to activate them. So you're not taking one single step from lead to activation, if that makes sense. Totally. So I want to dive more into that because I think both of us are on the same path of like own your audience. Right. right? And 100%. 100%. Own your audience wherever you can get them. Use social media to leverage uh, and your visibility and your reach. And I was on a call with someone today that said he wanted more exposure. And I said, okay, ta-da. Right. <laughs> but a lot of people would not want to expose themselves this way. That's right. But uh, you want Unless to they're use on Instagram, apparently. That <laughs> happens all the time. And that would get you clients, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Till you get banned. <laughs> Till you get banned. Yeah. And you uh, know what? That's a good point. Let's, can we stop there just for yeah. one sec? Because here's, this is totally about your point. Okay. Yeah. I know someone who runs uh, another marketing agency local where I am, and they spent years building this massive Instagram following. And I shouldn't say massive, but I mean, for a local marketing business, they had over 10,000 followers. That's good. Yeah. Instagram blocked their account. What? They don't know why. They've done every step that they can to try and get it back. They have no idea why it was blocked and it's gone and they can't get it back oh my with God. no explanation whatsoever. And they've never posted anything but business content and not even advertising. So oh if you want to own your audience, you know, if you're like you say, building your house on rented land, right? Yep. Yep. Instagram or Facebook or whoever it is, wherever it is, right? If you don't own it, they can it, like that. It's it gone. It yeah. Ends. And well, all those people are gone and none of them hear from you anymore. That's devastating. And so they did not have any, like for all these 10,000 people, they never actually, like nobody came to their site, nobody opted in, like nothing. Well, I don't know what they did for opt-ins and stuff after that. Right. Yeah. So I mean, maybe they've had some of them on a mailing list. Maybe they're on another kind of media, but oh. I mean, that's still a pretty big blow if, because so. A lot of times people focus on one kind of media that they're good at or that they like. Mm -hmm. So maybe they really like Facebook or they really like Instagram or they really like LinkedIn or whatever it is, right? Yep. But if you have all your eggs in that one basket and that basket gets taken away. Yep. Yep. It all, it, it all goes away. And, and right. what, what's fascinating about that is, you know, I always give this example of Gary Vee. A lot mm -hmm. of people, when they're, uh, when they're looking at social media and when they're thinking about business, they think about leads and followers, right? Um, Gary Vaynerchuk is building an audience. So if right. tomorrow we, uh, YouTube woke up and said, Gary, you cannot be on our, our platforms, I think the most he will do is shrug and go to the, you right. know, be like, okay, audience. Go to the other platform. Go to TikTok, yeah. right? Find me there. Right. Yeah. But and he's always saying, you know, you know, the send uh, or type, 2995 yeah. to this number to join up for the SMS list or get on the email list because we're providing all this value for entrepreneurs on, on the email list. And so he's always getting people onto other properties, mm -hmm. right? And he's like, if you watch our show on Instagram, you should watch it on Facebook Live because then you could type in questions. But now you can also watch it on YouTube Live and watch it on your TV in high def, right? There's always a reason to cross pollinate when he talks about stuff. Yes. And Gary is very, very big about owning his audience. Yes. Um, especially now. So uh, I had a conversation with an Instagram influencer the other day who found me through a guest post that I wrote somewhere else. And, um, and she was like, hey, what do you think about all these guys all of a sudden trying to collect phone numbers? 
Um, and, and you know, to me, and I think like, I would love to run this by you. I think sure. we might agree on the same thing. Um, so the internet came to be, right? And at the beginning it was blogging. And right. so that was one too many, right? Like I blog and everybody else sees me, but it's very hard to communicate, maybe right. in the comments. Um, then it turned into email, same thing, one too many. Then it moved to uh, teleseminars, to those who remember, <laughs> one too many. Right. Uh, then it moved to uh, webinars, same thing, right. one too many. Uh, then it moved to videos, same thing. Now there's no communication at all. It's just like, you know, you watch me and maybe you comment. Um, and now lives are, are doing exactly the same thing, one too many. I talk and you guys listen and watch me. Um, and the next step is this text messaging platform, which is, again, it's just a broadcast. There's no communication that's happening in that um, right. in that field, right? Um, and with all the bots and AI and technology and everything that's happening out there, do you find that they are contributing to the relationships and the trust in the business? You're dealing with real estate and high dollar money where people have to trust the person they're making the transaction with. So do you think all that stuff um, is actually contributing to that or you know, making it harder because there's so much noise, there's so many bots, there's so much AI, there's so much information um, that, you know, it defies a purpose. Right. So it depends how it's done. Mm -hmm. And if done correctly, then it will create trust. It'll create kind of, um, you know, a, 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 like a wave that people can start to remember you. They know more about you. They've seen your face before, so they trust you more. That kind mm -hmm. of stuff can happen. Mm -hmm. But if it's done incorrectly, or if it's too automated, then people just, they know it's not you and they start to associate everything that you say with it not being you, right? So if everything you do is posted by someone else yeah. and everything that you, you know, every time someone tries to communicate with you, it's, it's a bot or an auto automated answering system or it's some way that they can avoid talking to you, then there's, there's no trust there, right? There's no relationship there. It's just you're just, you might as well be like a corporate spokesperson or, you know, right, right. it doesn't make any difference because they're, they're not, they're not trusting who you are. And I love that you say, I mean, that. it happens all the time, right? Yeah. But there is some automation that that's positive, right? Um, so, I mean, automation is by no way bad, right. but it has to be done in a way where people understand that it's automated for one, right? Yeah. They also have to, like, like you and I talking right now and other people being on the show and potentially being able to ask questions and, and that kind of stuff is a communication between right. all of us. It's not one-sided, right? It's yeah. not just us talking to the audience. Like if we have a podcast and we have a guest or two, like my last podcast, we had two guests wow. and then, you know, we had two hosts. And so there's four of us having a conversation and we're talking about other people who have asked us things. And so there is communication there. Yeah. Um, if it's just broadcast, 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 and it's buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. Yeah. And then when somebody even tries to get a hold of you, they go through some automated bot process, you know, they don't get to reach you at all. Um, or even any person for that matter, then that's not building trust. I mean, you're not, you're not communicating at all. You're just broadcasting. You might as well be sending them flyers. <laughs> exactly right. Direct back to direct mail. Um, right. So we are we are streaming everywhere on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, uh, on Twitch. And so we just got a comment nice. from Twitch. Uh, the sure. guy says that I look like the chick from the Big Bang Theory. I hope <laughs> the nice chick. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what chick they have there, but thank you. I guess. I so heard that she actually had a PhD in physics. So. Ta-da! It, it might be the glasses, right? I might look smart. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, so I wore my glasses like just for this. I almost never wear them, but I was like, I look smart today. Wear my glasses, <laughs> and so I can see better. So there you go. So guys, if you're watching us, wherever you're watching us, if you want to join this conversation, uh, I'm thatgeek.com forward slash live is the place to be. Just hop on in right below the video. There's a button. Click that button. You'll be a part of our conversation in real time. So. Let's talk about that. So we're talking about trust and actually being authentic online and using social media to uh, get your name out there, uh, not necessarily to close leads. You want to do that in the private of your right. inbox or your SMS uh, messages system. But online, you want to be uh, the authority. 
you want to be become first choice you want to be knowledgeable and you want to help people so how do you stop the grinding and the being everywhere and actually focus on the stuff that moves the needle so there's a couple ways to do that and I think the first thing you need to do is identify where you're putting in your effort so you can kind of write down all the things that you do for your sales and marketing mm -hmm. and how much time you're spending on it and maybe which platform you're spending time on if you do more than one and uh, a good example would be let's take real estate for an example yeah. right um, our company we uh, we're a digital marketing agency we work usually with like brokerages or people who sell things to real estate agents so we're familiar with you know uh, how real estate agents act online um, we've got, I don't know, between all the clients, probably 150,000 real estate agents between all the lists and audiences and stuff. So, I mean, we have a lot of contact yeah. with real estate agents and they're all on Facebook. And, uh, there is, uh, I would say a very high percentage that are paying a company to post on their behalf. Mm. So they're using either a posting service or like a real estate social media posting service or they're buying like a package of posts that they could buy like a content library and they're scheduling that out through like Hootsuite or Sprout Social or something like that. So it's automatically scheduled out. The only thing that they're posting in between those things are their open house dates, right? So they're posting their opens in between that. And there is nothing there that is giving them any information about who they are as a person, what it's like to work with them. Um, how would you even interface with them in any way? Like all of that stuff is missing. Mm -hmm. And the worst case, uh, and I mean, this happened very recently is, uh, I was talking with someone in my neighborhood and they, uh, wanted to sell their house and they're following more than one real estate agent. Cause they're looking at a few of them to try and figure, like figure out which one they're going to pick. Cause they know more than one. Mm -hmm. And they had, a post from one real estate agent and a post from another one. And it was the exact same post because oh they're both God. using the same posting service, right? Oh my, so the same like content is showing up from both of them. And they're, they think one's copying the other, but they don't know which one it is because they don't understand that, that people are buying these services. But I mean, at the end of the day, the one who got the business is the one who was going live with their phone and walking through their property that they're just listing and showing it to them. Yep. Right. And they're saying, oh, here's this property. It's so nice. Look at this. Check this out. Check that out. Whatever. But you get to see them. You get to see their personality. Right. And it's it's really I mean, it like you said, it's one to many, mm -hmm. but it's really one to one because they got their phone. Right. Yeah. And they're just pointing it at themselves. Right. And walking through the house kind of thing. Yeah. And the person who's watching it is like this. <laughs> right. So it's yeah. like face to face with yeah. them. Right. Yeah. Um, so it is kind of a, a personal one-to-one -one connection, whereas having a posting service that says, which bathroom do you like better? And eight realtors have the same post on the same day in your city is, I mean, that's not value, right? Totally. And, and so that's, that actually puts a little bit of a challenge to, uh, people who suck at content, right? Uh, and sure. want to be seen out there and they hear from their friends and I love that stuff because if you do what everybody else does, you're going to feel like everybody else does. That's right. right. <laughs> so when, and you are a digital marketing agency that does provide services for people. So how, mm -hmm. let, let's talk about that. So someone is sure. in a grind, they suck at content creation. They don't know what to do. They're like, okay, let me outsource that. How do I know who to outsource that I still keep my voice and I don't sound like everybody else? So if you're going to outsource content, what you should be doing is partnering with, you shouldn't be a hundred percent outsourcing your content because some of it needs to be from you. Yeah. Now it's going to depend on your business, right? So we have some businesses where like if they're a manufacturer or maybe there's some kind of service industry business where the business owner is not the person who shows up at their house or it's something that's basically sight unseen, like, they're manufacturing car parts that go to a car distributor. They don't need to be posting on Facebook live video, right? Right. Um, so, but if you are someone who is the provider or you're the owner, the entrepreneur of a local business, you know, you're dealing directly with the public, then you're going to want to partner with someone who can tell you what kind of content should be put in what place and how is that going to be produced and what their role in is you know, in creating that content. 
And so I'll give you a good example. So we have a law firm that's a client mm -hmm. and we have a commercial photographer who goes, sets up all the equipment in their boardroom on the first Tuesday of every month. Mm -hmm. And then the um, lawyer who does kind of speaks, he's the, the, the head of, of the law firm. He comes in and he has a set of predefined questions that he's going to answer. Okay. And he sits down, everything's set up. We kind of check the lights, check the color, check the sound again. And then he reads off the script and answers questions for about 45 minutes. We film the whole thing. Then he goes back to work. And that's all he has to do every month is that 45 minutes of filming. Oh, fantastic. And then our video guy takes all the equipment down. He goes, he edits the videos. We post it. We set up advertising. We set up retargeting. We resize it for the right platforms. We do all of that work, right? Yeah. So 45 minutes of his time per month gets him advertising on five or six platforms where he gets seen by thousands of potential clients wherever those people hang out every single month in a personal face-to-face -face way, asking questions, answering questions about what the law firm does, how they work, you know, charity work that they do, all these other things that people are interested in. So he doesn't have to be engaging face-to-face -face and doing live video and trying to figure out if he should be posting stuff in three by four format on Facebook right. or square right. versus, you know, 16 by nine on YouTube or something. Right. right. So um, all of the technical knowledge and everything is released from him having to do it. He doesn't even have to have an account on any of those platforms. We do it for them. Which right? is fantastic because yeah. most people, um, you know, they, they just, you know, they don't know what to do it. They need someone to tell them, how do you get over the fact of like a deer in a headlight when someone looks at a camera and they just like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> so we figure out what point we use two cameras generally or three. And, um, you know, so like one's like this and one's like this, right. And one's mm -hmm. kind of like straight on lower, you know, and then we figure out where in the room the person needs to be looking to get the best shot. And that's where I sit. And oh, then nice. we film continuously and I ask the questions and they answer them back to me. Love it. And so that we're not like saying cut, okay, now answer this question and cut. Like we just talk like you and I are talking right now. Yeah. And then we cut that down into videos for ads. I love it because what you've done is you figured out a way to remove the camera from the entire thing and just have a conversation with the person so that they're not feeling like they're talking to a camera, they're talking to you. And so it's easier. So it's not kind of like, oh my God, someone's watching me. So if they say something funny, they see your reaction, you probably smile. <laughs> if it's right. funny, hopefully. And now like you take all the stress and the uh, unknown from, from it and all the performance and having to look so nice and all that jazz. That's fantastic. Um, so then you're posting those on YouTube, Facebook ads. Where, where are you uh, sharing that content? Uh, generally, we go um, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, and some of it depends on the client. So we all have different content. We post different places depending upon where their audience is, who they are. Um, we do heavily advertise for service businesses on Google because of the whole Google Maps thing now mm -hmm. or the map box kind of, if you're not in the map box, you don't exist at this point. Yep. So, you know, we, we do a lot of map advertising and optimization for service businesses. But I think what's going to get lost on people is they're going to say, well, you know, I don't have five or $10,000 to pay for video every single month, obviously, right? A lot of businesses don't have the money of a law firm, yeah. right? But it doesn't mean you can't do it and you can't figure out what to do. And so there's a system and um, I could quick shout out, you had um, Roland Frazier on your show, right? Yes, one of my favorite guys in the whole world. Right. So <laughs> After you, of course. <laughs> right, uh, yeah, after me. After you. Um, <laughs> So he has a system that he uses and, uh, you know, he, he didn't invent the system, right? Yeah. But the system is basically comes from an old manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. And in my book, I kind of made it simple to remember. It's called ICE, but it has two C's in it. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is you would design a chart where you'd write all your ideas down one side of how you're going to do any kind of sales or marketing. And then you'll have four columns on that chart. The first one's impact, which is the I, right? Mm -hmm. and the second one's confidence. And then you have cost and effort. Okay. So you take how much impact is your idea going to have and you rate it from like one to 10. And then how confident are you that it's going to work is one to 10. Mm -hmm. 
and you add those two things together and then how much is it going to cost you? You rank that one to 10. How much effort is it going to take? You rank that one to 10. You add those two together and then you subtract them from the previous total. So I'll give you an example. Yeah. Let's say uh, posting every week on your Facebook page. Probably, you know, seven people are going to see it and two of them are your parents. So impact is not great, right? Unless right. you're paying to use Facebook now, you're not going to get any reach anymore. So like you give the impact like a one out of 10. Okay. But you're fairly confident that that's, you know, you're going to reach a few people. So you give that like a three. So that would be a four in the positive. And then the cost is zero because it doesn't cost you any money to post. And the effort is one because it only takes a few minutes once a week to post. So you subtract the one from the four, that gives you a total of three. Now you do that for every single idea you have. And so let's say another idea would be, I want to have in-person events to get clients. Right. So the impact is eight out of 10 because you're like, it's going to have a big impact if I'm like live yeah. in person talking with people, right? And I'm fairly confident that's going to work. So that's about an eight. So that's like 16. And then the cost is, is pretty high, right? So it's about a five. And the effort, I got to put in a lot of work to plan the event and be there. So that's about a five. So if you take 10, like you take, sorry, 16, subtract 10, it gives you a six. So the next thing you should do is plan an event because it's a six yeah. instead of posting weekly on Facebook because that's a three. Love right? it. I love it. So, so you can make a list of every idea. And then once you make all those totals, it tells you, you just pick the one with the highest number and you work your way down the list till you run out of time. Love it. Makes sense? Totally. Um, so really funny. We're getting a lot of engagement on Twitch. And there is one nice. guy, Wow Legion Preview. Uh, who keeps going like, I said hello, so hello. Hello. <laughs> We're seeing you. Welcome. Um, if you have anything to contribute, please come That's and right. contribute. Um, so, okay, so I love that. So you actually, not you're looking at impact and effort, and based on that, you decide what you're going to do. Um, and if mm -hmm. you can outsource that, then you find someone who will not... Uh, do research and create content for you, but use your own voice, kind of like what you're doing when you're filming people. Uh, use your own voice, make you feel comfortable to create the content, and then they're in charge of the distribution so you don't have to spend your time on that. Um, so the next question uh, is, we created the content, content, we distributed I it, um, and now what happens with the engagement? Are you handling engagement for clients or do they jump in and interact? Um, some we do, some we don't. So it's kind of really depends on their business again, but like a good interaction for uh, like a service-based business or a local business is just getting the phone to ring, right? Yeah. We want the phone to ring. And then on their end, we need to make sure that they have the ability to answer the phone and close deals. Yeah. Um, you know, we honestly, we're a bit pretty, pretty picky with our, our clients that we're going to work with. Mm -hmm. um, if you know, we give them a call and there's problems reaching someone or, you know, we have a hard time with, you know, maybe they have a lot of reviews that say people don't call them back or whatever, right? We're like, well, we're not going to advertise them more so that they can not answer the phone, right? right? So um, you have to make sure there's process in place for them to handle the amount of business that they're going to get. Yeah. Um, and also we need to make sure that they are, you know, usually fairly established. Mm -hmm. um, we will work with some startups and stuff if they're, you know, maybe they're a dentist or a doctor, or, you know, a mortgage or something like that, a real estate team. Um, and, you know, we can help them with that stuff. Um, if it's something like e-commerce, mm -hmm. usually we're directing people through to the point of purchase. And then we also help them with follow-up, um, retargeting, cross-selling, you know, stuff like that after the fact. Got it. Um, so before we, we started uh, the show, you and I in the green room, we're talking about, you know, how everybody's doing the same thing. And you, we kind of touched on that, mm -hmm. um, on, you know, hiring the same company right. and posting the same content. But a lot of people don't know how to stand out and how to differentiate themselves in, in all those markets, right? They hear people saying like, oh, I just use this company, go use that company, not knowing what effect it might do. Um, so how do you, uh, what's the system? What's the strategy 
to help people stand out in a very busy market, noisy market where everybody sounds the same and um, and they, you know, everybody has the same job, but they want to be a little bit different. What can they do differently? Right. So I would say that the biggest problem that I find is people don't know what the other people in their industry are marketing. <laughs> Nobody's like they know to anybody. There's just like, they know how they're selling. Right. Yeah. So like, like if you talk to one real estate agent, they can tell you what other real estate agents tell their clients, but they can't necessarily tell you what their websites say or mm -hmm. what they're posting on Facebook or that kind of thing. So they're not really, and, and not just real estate agents, I mean, any business, right? Yeah. They're generally not kind of shopping their competition. Um, but beyond shopping your competition, there's also um, getting to really know who your customer is. Mm. And I mean, the worst thing that you hear is somebody who, let's say they have a brand of, I don't know, skin lotion or something, right? And they stand up in front of a group of people and they say, hey, my customer is anybody who has skin, right? right. And, well, that's absolutely not true, right? So it's, I mean, generally, like if they're, say their skin lotion is, is for women, then it's not, half your market's gone already, right? Because all men have skin and men don't need your women's lotion, right? <laughs> and then... Um, their lotion is $45 a bottle. So now every person who can't afford that is not their customer, right? Mm -hmm. And then everyone who's not going to pay for that is not their customer. And everyone who's already loyal to another brand is probably not their customer. So what they're doing is they're not drilling down to figure out who their customer is. Mm -hmm. um, there's a thing, uh, people call it different names. We call it customer avatar, right? Okay. Who is who is kind of the character in your mind that is your perfect customer. You kind of make up this persona of who, of who your customer is and you could have different ones, but um, the, that sort of perfect client that you're trying to find and by researching who your clients have been in the past is a good way to figure this out. Yeah. And I mean, I've had people who are constantly trying to sell to like, they're like, oh, I need to reach millennials. And they're like, advertise to millennials. And we do all this. And we look at their past clients and Customer. every one of them except okay. for two is over 50, oh. right? We're like, so you're completely missing the, the market, right? right? And by shifting that, um, they suddenly get, you know, like mad success doing the same things they were doing before, but they were trying to reach the wrong people. Right. Gotcha. So you, are you talking about advertising, like uh, figuring out how to like who the target market is? Or are you talking about, you know, social media posting as well? It doesn't matter what sales or marketing uh, tactic you're using. Mm -hmm. You should know in advance who your customer is that you're trying to talk to, yeah. because that determines who you're going to talk to. Where do they go online? What do they do when they're offline? Uh, how old they are? How many kids they have? What do they watch on television? If they even watch television or OTT or whatever kind of TV they would watch, right? Connected television <laughs> right. or something. Um, like if you don't know all those things, then you don't know how to sell to them. Yeah. Because you're not, you're not connected to them. Right. Yeah. So um, I have, I will keep using real estate as an example because it's a good example for, for relationship building. Right. Um, so I know a real estate agent locally um, and they had determined kind of the age range and some other information about the customer that they would like to work with. Mm -hmm. And they figured out that those people generally um, are in like clubs and stuff locally for like, that's how they, they socialize is they go to like book clubs and knitting circles and, right. and, and all these kind of in-person clubs. So they joined those clubs and then suddenly they started doing twice as many deals as they were before. Amazing how that happens, right? right? Because they found where their customer is and yeah. they're underserved communities, right? They're, yeah. they're people who don't have access to real estate people, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas if you go to like a free networking group in your city, like a free business networking group, and there's 14 insurance people and 12 real estate agents and, you know, like 13 insurance people and mortgage people and because they're all trying to get the same clients at the same place, why? They're all doing the same thing. And what they need to be is doing the opposite, right? Um, another good example that's also real estate related is um, on the Digital Marketing Masters podcast, we just interviewed uh, Chris and Tiffany Larson. Mm -hmm. And Chris Larson has a real estate brokerage um, for a specific city. Uh, he wanted it. It's uh, Oswego Real Estate Group because he 
is just in the city of Lake Oswego. That's just kind of south of Portland. And he looked at all the other signs around town and they're all basically um, red and white and blue real estate signs that are square. Mm -hmm. So he made his um, basically a different brighter shade of blue, no red at all, circular signs that are different than everybody else's sign. And, and everybody it. he talks to goes, oh, you're that guy who has the round real estate signs. <laughs> Nobody else has round ones, right? Yeah. And he immediately is distinguished between the other agents because he says, well, you know what else we do differently? <laughs> da, 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 right? Yeah. So. You, you know what? I love what you're saying about that because, uh, and, and actually this is going to go to the next question. Um, you're saying, watch what everybody else is doing and do something different. Right? And do the opposite. Do the opposite. Do it better. <laughs> do the opposite. Um, right. Which is a little bit hard to do on social media because it's images, text, videos, right? Um, but there are other ways to connect with people. So watch what everybody else is doing and then do the opposite. Most people, when they start marketing and they have no clue, they go and find the experts, right? The gurus. And then right. the guru go like, dude, you should be doing live twice a day. So, okay, let me do live twice a day. And you should do it in this format. And here's the strategy. And here are the hours that you're supposed to do that. Um, so if you don't know anything, you don't have years of experience with internet marketing, you go like, well, so it so said so, so, and it's working for them. So I should do right. exactly the same thing. So Most of that advice that? is terrible. <laughs> Just to let you know. So here's the problem. I shouldn't say the advice is terrible. The advice was really good when the person first gave the advice. <laughs> you mean but five what years happens ago, is, six years ago? Right. Well, so, so some 10 other people heard that advice and said, I'm going to write an article about this. And they all posted an article. And 10 people saw those articles were so popular. So they wrote articles about it. And then it kind of perpetuates itself. Yep. And then, you know, even now, people are quoting articles that quoted articles that quoted articles uh, five, six years ago. And they're saying the best time to post on Facebook is Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Right. Like, and that's completely untrue, right? Yeah. So for starters, the algorithm that Facebook, we'll just talk just specifically Facebook, okay? Yeah. The algorithm that Facebook uses determines which recent things that were posted by people or companies or ads to show someone, mm -hmm. right? Based on which it thinks is going to get the most engagement. Right. And in a certain time frame. And so the time it's posted, unless it was more than a couple of days ago, has no bearing whatsoever on if it gets shown to anyone. So true. Right. Yeah. The other thing is, and this is a big thing. And so you and I probably know this just from, from the amount of work that we've done online, but most people don't know this. And this, every single business owner I've told this to recently has told me that no one has ever told them this before. Now I'm curious. What is it? The algorithm is not on the side of the person posting the content. The algorithm is on the side of the person looking at the content. Right. So the algorithm, when I log on to Facebook, it knows it has roughly 100, 200,000 fields of things that it knows about me. It takes all of that information and all of the possible content it could show me, and then it makes a decision of what to show me next. Yeah. Business owners think when they post that they're trying, that the algorithm is then deciding who it's going to show it to, which is completely not true. Yeah. It's the person who's viewing the content, the algorithm determines what gets shown to them based on their preferences, not based on Facebook's preferences. And Does that so make sense? If, yeah, totally. And so if you, uh, it, it's very funny because uh, we uh, were talking about the reality game, right? Like how right. our life and how reality now is dictated by algorithms and bots and AI. And so when I log into my dad's Facebook, Oh my God, the stuff that I see there, right? Like, and which never appears on my feed. And right. even if we might be following the same people or some of the same people, I never see the stuff that shows up on his Facebook because I'm not signing up for the whole craziness of the news, right? right? And so every person has a completely different feed than the person next to them. And that feed, exactly what you're saying, is based on their preferences. So if you go around in Facebook and just like, 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 Whatever you're liking, you're going to see more of. Whatever right. you're commenting, you're going to see more of. And it has nothing to do with who posted. 
uh, or not. Now, Facebook also has a weighting system, right? And and by weight, I mean how much um, how much they want people to be shown certain types of content. So things that are um, controversial uh, generally get shown more because there's mm -hmm. more engagement, and engagement is what they're selling, right? right. right. We want people to stay on our app longer. Yeah. So anything that makes you stay longer, for example, live video, <laughs> right? Yeah. Makes people stay on the app longer and makes them engage with it more. So you get a benefit when you do the things that the app wants you to do, right? So if you're a business owner and you want to reach people who have not heard of you, posting a picture or some information on your Facebook page will not reach people you don't know. Yep. It won't, period. Like it just does not happen unless someone shares it and the person who shares it, obviously they have to share it and have enough people who want to see that, that they will also share it. Then you might be able to reach some new people. However, if you're doing live video, they will show it to people that they think are interested in that content, even if they're not your follower. So that is one of the only ways right now that you can reach new people on Facebook without paying. I love that you say that because all the stats that we're seeing, 50% of the views come from people who never followed us. Um, so yeah, and all those platforms, they wanna be the go-to destination, the one destination where people are sitting there watching live video, engaging and communicating. So there is kind of like a war between who's going to be the final de final destination. Oh my God, <laughs> I'm saying this. <laughs> <Da, da, da. laughs> no, and in Israeli, a Jew, I was like, oh, but um, <laughs> but they want to be the last resort of uh, of where you're going to be watching their content. And so they are going to push it and push it and you get so many views and so many uh, new I guess it's just views because unless people click on it or comment or something like that, it's just another form of impression, right? It's not necessarily going to turn into anything unless you follow up with it, right? right. Well, Facebook will, um, if they say they watch your live video and you stay and you watch it, you know, for a period of time, yeah. then they will suggest that to you again later or suggest that your page is one that they should follow um, or that maybe you're someone they should be friends with. Yeah. Um, the same thing will happen with Instagram because they have a similar algorithm. Because um, it's Facebook, who knew, right? Yeah, because Facebook owns it, right? And like, if you look at what, I mean, okay, super easy question, right? Mm -hmm. What's what's the, the um, app right now, social media app that is growing the fastest? TikTok. 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 What are people watching on TikTok? It's only yeah. video. Only video. Right? Silly videos, you know? It's but you just feel like, oh my God, it's been right. 30 minutes and I'm just doing this. <laughs> Oh yeah, you can you can lose a lot of hours yeah. watching TikTok, honestly. And the thing with TikTok is it's not geographically relevant. Yeah. Um, uh, you can you can make it that way. I've done some testing. So I did some searches for like Portland, Oregon, Beaverton, Oregon, Hillsborough, Oregon. Mm -hmm. When I found people who posted with those tags, I hit the like button on it, and now I see videos that are local from local people. Oh, nice. That's um, so there is some localization to it, but um, generally, like if you're a plumbing company, opening a TikTok account is not going to help you no. right now. I mean, it's just, it's not a good use of your time. Um, but posting plumbing information on Facebook is not a good use of your time either. Right. Right. So, maps, so Google maps and Google search. Right. Yep. And if you were say, um, like recording videos about frequently asked questions about like, what to do if my sink drips all the time and how, how can I tell if it's, you know, something's wrong or how do I, how do, what happens if there's a backup in my sewer or whatever, right? What, what is a backflow test for? Yeah. And, and these kinds of information that people might find useful, right? Um, you put that out on Facebook, you stick a few ad bucks behind it, right? Mm -hmm. Like even I, I'm really a big fan of, taking an informational post, like an FAQ type video or post, putting it on Facebook and saying, I wanted to show it to people within 10 miles of my business or five miles of my business or whatever kind of your service area is and putting a dollar a day or $2 a day of ad money behind it. Really? That's enough. That's enough, right? Yeah. And if you're a small local business, that's more than enough, right? Yeah. And then doing that every week 
so that generally you have at least three or four ads running to your to your local area mm -hmm. that are about whatever that topic is that you're doing. I mean, it doesn't sound like much, right? But if you were to say run, you know, a video about something to do with home repairs or maybe backflow testing is a good example, right? If you're a plumber or something, because that's something that at least where we live, you, you, the city makes you, if you own a home, you have to get a backflow test every so often. Mm -hmm. So that's an informational video that you could put out when the city is going to send out the notices that people need backflow tests. Um, Cause if you're in that industry, you know, when that is, then you run what's a backflow test and how do you get one as a video and you run it to everybody in your city and you put $2 a day behind it in 30 days. That's about 60 bucks. Uh, the average CPM is about $20 for local. So that means you're going to reach 3000 people. Okay. That's pretty good. And you'll get one, two, 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 three to 10 jobs more than paid for itself. Yeah. If you get 0.1% return, then you get three backflow tests out of that 60 bucks. More so as long as, time. yeah, if, if the money, you know, if, if the math makes sense, then, then do it. And I mean, you're going to get different responses from different things. Like say you're a real estate agent yeah, um, and you're running 60 bucks a month and boost posts, right? Yeah. What's the commission on the average house sale in your area, right? Yeah. What's between, you know, between two and 8% of, you know, it depends on if they're on both sides of the deal. Right. But you know, of a uh, 300,000, I think $350,000 or something is the average home value around Portland right now, maybe a little higher if you're in Portland. Um, you know, that's, it's eight, $16,000 somewhere in there, depending upon how much percentage you have. This is it worth 60 bucks a month to get 16 <laughs> grand? I'd say yes. Right. right? And, and not a lot of work, actually, you know, you just pull up your phone, talk to the phone, put it up there and, um, and put $2 behind it. Most of the time when I heard people say, uh, you know, two dollar ads. Uh, pe people saying it's not going to make much of a difference at all. So, is it only going to make a difference when you're a local business, or is it for everybody? Um, I mean, the reason I would do kind of boosting posts is just because it's so easy. Yeah. Um, if you have the money to put into an advertising campaign, you should have somebody who understands how Facebook ads work. Yeah. Before yeah. you advertise yeah, on them. Yet. Because it's, it's really easy to melt a credit card on Facebook. Yes. You know, um, same with Google ads are the same way. You can incorrectly check a button and, you know, watch $500 disappear in, in an hour, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you have I, uh, to one of, one of my uh, careful with it. One of my guys uh, lost $70,000 on a Facebook campaign that did not work. So yes, very easy to do that kind of yeah. stuff. And he had an expert with him. Um, so let's. Well, you got to be careful, and you got to you got to understand how to test those kind of things. If you're doing stuff at a larger scale, yeah. Um, then you should be running test campaigns first, and those test campaigns, uh, you know, should be um, a lot of testing, not let, not just like split testing two ads kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, there is a, a myriad of ads that we create for testing. Um, most ad campaigns that we run to start out with, we're looking at usually five different ad formats with anywhere from two to 25 ads in each section for that format. So in some cases, it's hundreds of ads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of people don't want to, you know, um, I love what you're saying that because a lot of them, they hear this and they are like, oh, my God, so much work. Uh, which is why you can outsource it. You don't have to do all the right. work yourself. You should outsource you know. anything that you don't need to be doing that you're not an expert in if you have the money for it. I exactly. mean, you should either be outsourcing it, hiring people and delegating or, you know, whatever that looks like. But I mean, like how many businesses are still doing their own bookkeeping when yeah. they can hire a good bookkeeper for probably $60 an hour and, or less, you know, in some yeah. cases? Um when they generate their business, like the effort that they put into their business makes $300 an hour. Right. They could hire a bookkeeper for 60, but instead they're spending 10 hours doing their books when they could have a bookkeeper do it in three hours. Like how much loss is that? You know, I think people just don't do the math most of the time. And, um, and I think also, you know, when you start out, all you have is your time. Like you have more time than money. So you get used to doing all that stuff. And when you get, there's a point, right? There's a point where your hour is worth more than it was when you just started. And that would be the point where you want to start 
outsourcing and uh, and delegating. Um, before we before we finish, because we're getting to the end, I really want to talk about your podcast. Um, sure. First of all, guys, right here below um, on this website, I'm thatgeek.com. Right to the right of the video, you'll see a banner. You can click on it and go directly to Matt's podcast. It's fantastic. You should definitely listen to it. Um, but let's talk about podcasting as two things. One, as a marketing avenue, right? Like ex uh, expanding your visibility. Uh, two, as relationship building with the guests and the audience. Um, and three, it sounds to me like that is the main avenue of uh, how you get known. So, uh, so let's talk about that. Like, what impact does the podcast have in your business? I know all these questions. Are, pff, pick, right. one. <laughs> pick one. Pick <laughs> one. So, the reason that we do our podcast is not for lead generation. Okay. Uh, a lot of people's podcasts are for lead generation. There's nothing wrong with doing your podcast for lead generation. Um, it's going to kind of depend on your business, obviously, but podcasting by itself is not lead generation unless you're also marketing your podcast. Mm -hmm. That's something that most people do not realize. Okay. Putting out a podcast doesn't mean people are going to listen to it 99.9% .9 of the time. That's true. So you also need to be marketing your podcast. So, um, you know, if you're a small business owner and you think I'm going to make a podcast, and I'm going to get a whole bunch of business from it. What you've done is just created a second business you have to <laughs> advertise, right? Yeah. Like it's just another thing you have to do marketing for. And then now you also have to manage a podcast and a production schedule and trying to get guests if you have interviews. And, and so you've just created a whole myriad more work right. um, for something that may or may not benefit you, right? Yeah. Now, you may be in the case of some types of businesses like um you can have an interview show and go pick the people that you want to get as clients mm -hmm. and ask them to come on your show for you to interview them and now you have a chance an opportunity to talk with them and make them your clients yep so that's the lead generation piece that works better for most people with podcasts mm -hmm. um and in that case they don't really care about the listeners and the views they, it's just about the relationship that you build with the person you're interviewing right yeah and our podcast is basically for two things. Um, number one is I want to have connections and relationships with people like you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and this is the best way for me to meet those people. Yeah. This, is, this is straight up. That's it. I just want to meet the other people who are smart, intelligent people in the business world because that helps grow my business, right? Because yeah. if I, you know, I learn things from you that I can use in my business, that's great. Mm -hmm. And the other reason that we do it is... Um, it's for retention uh, and activation. I guess that's two things, but I kind of lump those two together for the for the podcast, yeah. which is people already know me or know of our company before they listen to our podcast. Okay. So they hear about it from somewhere else, then they listen to it, then maybe they see some stuff on social media about us, or maybe they read one of the books, right? And uh, then they become our client, right? So then they start interacting with it. So it's more of an activation. Remember I was talking mm -hmm. act, like acquisition for customers, and activation should be two separate things. Right. We're not using the podcast for acquisition. We're using it for activation. I love that distinction. Get it's people so to become customers. So there's, there's really only five ways that you can grow your business. Okay. There is, um, there's, Acquisition, which is getting more leads, right? Mm -hmm. There's retention, which is take the customers that you now have and keep them longer. There is monetization, which is can I sell more to the people I already have as customers? Right. There's activation, which can I turn those leads into paying customers? And then there's revenue, which is finding new sources of revenue. Generally, finding new sources of revenue is either ways to turn costs into profits or new product offerings that you can offer the people you already have. Yeah. So an example of like turning a cost into a profit is I used to write on our blog on hookseo.com slash blog. And I would blog almost every day at one point. And then I, it was like weekly because I was getting busy. Then I found out I could go blog on Medium and I could get paid for it. So now I'm, I'm getting paid to blog where I used to blog on my own website for free, right? So... I still do a little bit on our blog, but 
Uh, most of my blogging now is on a medium. Uh, we have a medium publication that's also called Digital Marketing Masters, just like the podcast. We use it for backlinking, you know, so, which is great for SEO. And that's something that was a cost that I've turned into revenue. I love that. And a lot of Makes people sense. don't, yeah, totally. They don't think about this. Like, um, this is also one of the things that Roland loves to do, right? Like, if we have an in house marketing team that grinds out content and we pay them, uh, why don't we offer that marketing team to other companies? And now we turn that cost into a revenue because other people are paying us to use the same team that we're that we're using. So there, right. right? There are many ways that you can think not even outside the box. Like just think differently of what you know what takes so much of your time and doesn't need to. Uh, what does you know cost you so much money and how can you leverage that and change it so that maybe offer it to other people. Uh, what can give you more money, like being an affiliate for Amazon or for uh, other people uh, using your audience, you know, just helping them, not bombarding them with affiliate offers. Right. <laughs> All right. How can that help? Uh, so there's so many ways that you can be, um, you know, helping the world and helping yourself at the same time. And most of us feel like we have to do all of it on our own. And I think that's where the grind comes in. Because you're like, ah, oh, now I have to do content calendars, and I have to do video, and I have to do email, and I have to do funnels, and I have to do blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah. And you don't take a vacation. <laughs> right. And then you never get to take a vacation because you got to be there all day, every day, or your company stops making money. Right. And, you know, they, and speaking of Roland Fraser, he's the one that I heard that said, you know, that they have dancing bear syndrome. As soon as you stop, the bear stops dancing, the money stops coming in. Oh, right? I love that. I never heard that. You need to get away from that. <laughs> Dancing bear syndrome. I like that. Yes. Um, so let's, uh, one last thing. So you're doing sure. podcasting, um, not as a lead generation, but more of an activation thing. Um, how did that come about? Why did you decide to do it with Jeremy and not like, hey, I'm just going to have my own podcast? Um, so we kind of started out doing it um, a couple of years ago, and then we were going to launch, and then I wasn't really happy with the results. Hmm. So what, did, what, didn't you um, like? what didn't you like about that? I didn't like the, I mean, the sound quality was poor, which is something that really bothered me because I had like a kind of an older car. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have like Bluetooth or anything to connect to my car speakers. And I would listen to podcasts with just my phone on full blast volume oh. when I'm driving to listen to the podcast. I couldn't hear half the guests on the podcast because their sound quality was so crappy. Mm. Right. Um, so we kind of retooled it, started over. And, you know, I have Dan, uh, Daniel Craig is his name. He does our, our podcast for us and our voiceovers. He also reads my books for, you know, puts them on Audible. Nice. Um, and now, I mean, we have better recordings. Our, our podcast sounds fantastic. I mean, your show sounds great too, right? Thank you. Yeah, everybody um, come on over yeah. to the podcast, listen to my show. And you don't have to have like your car stereo cranked to hear the yeah. guest because it's recorded on something that sounds like a 1970s AM radio, right? <laughs> um, so the quality's there and, you know, we... I, I spend a lot of time nurturing relationships to find guests that I think are both valuable to us as people that we want to know and talk to, but also valuable to the guests, to our, our listeners. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a real, um, it's been a real change for our business. And I think for the businesses of the people who listen to it, because we've had so many people who have so many great ideas that, um, you know, it's very educational and, if somebody's not going to be able to teach you something, I don't have them on the show. Yeah, same here. <laughs> so, uh, so you've been at it for like a little bit over a year. How was it at the beginning? Right. So a year ago when you started, there are already a bunch of podcasts out there. How did you start building your uh, listeners and your audience? So we did it through the channels that we had already created. So we already have our own social media accounts. We have our mailing list. We have um, obviously access to marketing and advertising and PR because you know, we do all those things as an agency. Yeah. Um, so it's a bit easier for us than, you know, the average person who's just starting out. But um, I would say the biggest thing is to get guests on your show who will also promote your show for you. Mm -hmm. um, so when you go on their show, like I'm on this one right now, right? And you were on mine. Um, you know, that kind of promotes both of our shows at the same time. Right. And having guests who will do that for you and also promote it helps it grow really quickly. And, you know, so, I mean, we, we don't have a huge, we don't have hundreds of thousands of listeners. Um, but it's also kind of interesting to think, you know, I'm, 
you know, we're, we're a small eight person agency in a little suburb of Portland, Oregon, and I have seven to 10,000 people listen to our podcast. So. Fantastic. Yeah. That's really nice. Um, so uh, what's, what's for you? What are you looking for in the next decade? What are you uh, wishing for yourself? Uh, we have a lot going on uh, at the agency itself. Um, also, I have a few more books in the works. You can probably see these behind me. Yeah. Start, start saying, saying yes. Like yes. <laughs> yeah. Start saying yes is about customer service and customer experience, mm. which was written after in a small, short few month period. Uh, my wife and I actually had a string of terrible customer service experiences. <laughs> and I was just like, I wanted to kind of write about the lost art of of customer service. Yeah. Um, and that one also goes into a lot about referral marketing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good, uh, it's a good book if you want to kind of relearn, you know, kind of, kind of relearn how customer experience is done now, um, you know, versus how it used to be and uh, how you can use those experiences to get more customers. And then, of course, the one that we were talking about here is flattening the hamster wheel. Yep. And that's about how to stop grinding and start making an impact. And that has kind of some of the strategies I talked about here and some other information in it. Um, and they're both very short. They're uh, large print. You can read each one in about an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, was, that a, was that a goal when you wrote that? It's intentional, yeah. That's the average business flight time in the United States. Oh, very nice. So if you want to, uh, technically it's an hour and 30 something minutes, I think the average was when I looked it up. But, you know, you can't really read your book for the first five and the last five minutes, you know? Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's yeah. So, and so uh, uh, I was just going to say, I've, uh, uh, I'm, I just published the new edition uh, of Flattening the Hamster Wheel. So if you buy it from this point forward, you get the new one. Very good. So, guys, uh, what's amazing about uh, what Matt was sharing today is that a lot of people say do things differently. I mean, Apple has them as a slogan, right? Like do it differently. But we don't necessarily know what that means for specifically for ourselves. And most people, when they go out to the internet and like, okay, I need to start marketing, they're just doing what everybody else does. Download my content marketing for the year. Here are the posts that you need to do. Write about this. If you're starting out with no audience, then you're basically talking to the void because nobody's going to hear that stuff, right? And there's so much content out there. So Matt shared specific strategies that you can do right now to stop grinding and finding out what will move the needle the most. Uh, he was sharing Roland's system, which is not Roland, someone else, but we don't remember. <laughs> and uh, you can just apply that and figure out which one will make the most impact. And once you make that impact, then you have some resources that you can start putting into maybe advertising or maybe uh, podcasting or maybe more marketing, some, you know, things that will save your time, but will get you more impact. So not going out and doing what everybody else is doing and just blasting social media um, will probably make you sleep better at night <laughs> without worrying about like, ah, I didn't post that one thing. So if you want more of these tactics, go buy the book. And if you want to listen to amazing conversation because Matt and Jeremy are fantastic hosts, they're doing a great job at like finding out exactly what uh, people would want to hear and how to get the most uh, out of their guests. And it's really fascinating conversations that will help you um, move the needle as well, not having to figure it out all on your own. So uh, highly recommend it. Again, it's right there to the left of the video. Click on that and you'll get there. Um, Matt, thank you so very much. I love that we have this relationship and that we met through social media and now we met face to face. That's right. And, um, and, I'm and now we're on TikTok with. too. And now we're on TikTok too, right? <laughs> and none of us is doing anything there, but we're on TikTok. That's right. <laughs> we were connected. So if you want to find us on TikTok, go find us on TikTok. We're connected. You can be connected too. Uh, don't expect any content though, right? <laughs> yeah. I post a little bit, but I have a test account that I use more because I'm trying to like figure out how to sell stuff on TikTok for like consumer. So I don't really, I mean, uh, that's what I use for testing. It's not to, to figure it out, but you know, it's, there's, there's, if you're a consumer brand, especially for young people right now for, and, and when I say young people, I'm saying people under 30, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you should be learning how TikTok works and maybe looking at also um, Byte. And that is kind of the new version of Vine that was just released, uh, I think, a few days ago. So. Did you say Byte? Yeah. it's. Um, do you remember Vine, the six-second yeah. video app that TikTok is pretty much based off of? Right. Um, 
Yeah, so they there's a new one. I think it's called Byte. I think it's B Y T E. I'd have to look. It's in the App Store. And and so you know, I like okay. <laughs> Are we like just moving towards dummification of our population because now we're not even reading, <laughs> right? That's There's right. no real... Now it's six second video. It's six yeah. seconds and most of those video, six seconds is like someone dancing. Like, yeah. <laughs> where are we going with this? <laughs> well, I mean, there's still like most of the people who read the books that I write yeah. buy the paperbacks. Um, so if you're in kind of a business entrepreneurial world, um, most people there, I mean, they all, you know, have Kindles and phones and all that kind of stuff and tablets or whatever. Yeah. But half the time they still like to read a print book. You know, I, I still have, you can tell by my bookshelf, yeah. right? I mean, I still read business books as books and, uh, you know, I read kind of my science fiction novels on the Kindle. So um, just because something's new doesn't mean it's necessarily better, and uh, but it also doesn't mean it's worse, right? It's yeah. just uh, it's a preference of what people like. And, you know, back when you had to go and, and turn the knob on the television to the 13 channels that there was, that, right? Yep. <laughs> um, you know, you only had so many choices. You just have more choices now. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of scary ones that what you like. becomes, yeah. What becomes popular, it's, uh, you know, it's the quick gratification things and um sometimes it makes me worry about where our society is going to uh you know the, the circle of people that you can have intelligent conversation with it's shrinking and shrinking and shrinking yeah well i think a lot of it's kind of niching down too so you can still find people who are interested in things that you're interested in yeah online more easily right like if um you know i have i have some like dungeons and dragons books right here right I have a huge community of people online about dungeons and dragons that i talk to that i never would have met in any other way um i have a group of too. people that yeah. I, have, I have a group of people that i met on reddit that come to my house every month for the last three years to play dungeons and dragons once a month like it's something that never would have happened before right yeah no i agree with you and social media so there be... it can you know well i was gonna say it can lead to in-person real life relationships oh i you know i come from google plus that's uh, totally um but that's not gonna happen in tiktok because there's not enough time or text or content for you to connect with someone over a dance i wouldn't say reddit Except is all about reading right tiktok has tiktok live also so you can yeah. go live uh, for any length of time i think the time limit's 360 minutes yeah I haven't caught those lives yet, uh, but can it's you there. It's coming, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. it's still a pretty young platform. So, um, you know, I'm not saying if you're a plumber, you should go out and start doing TikTok, right? No. But, um, you know, if you're a consumer brand, then you better be there now, right? Yeah. Do you think yeah. Coca Cola is not pushing content on TikTok right now? Like, yeah. And don't, don't worry about China and everything that they're doing and the fact that they own the, the app. Like, <laughs> That's well, nobody knows what happens that. with any of their data now anyway <laughs> so like i mean data security is a whole nother conversation right. and um i mean i have a chapter in flattening the hamster wheel about figuring out where your data goes and where your backups are and where your information is and protecting your business it's super important super super important so guys last time go check that out we are 10 minutes over thank you very much for sticking around uh thank really you appreciate you and um once last time, I'm thatgeek.com forward slash live to the right of the video. You can hear the podcast. And I'm assuming when they join the podcast, they can find you. Where can they find you and where can they buy the book? Uh, books on Amazon. So it's easy to find. Just type in flattening the hamster wheel or you can go to hook to that's H O O K T O dot U S slash H A M S T E R. That's hook to dot us slash hamster. And any podcast provider should have Digital Marketing Masters. There are two Digital Marketing Masters podcasts. Ours is the one that has like a icon that looks like a, a, a headset. So it should be easy to find. <laughs> and uh, if you want, episode 43 of Digital Marketing Masters is building a brand live with Yifat Cohen. Yeah, the best episode. That's so you can right. start with 43 and then move down the other side. That's right. <laughs> So thanks again. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Have a fantastic week. And we'll see you in two weeks from now for another show of I'm That Geek. Bye. Bye.